All right. Good morning, everyone. God bless you. Nice to be with you. Nice to be here. Um, as we have been working through this chapter here in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, it's been exciting to come to this last section because I've been looking forward to this last section for a little while. It's always been an ex- exceptionally exciting uh, portion to me. And uh, we want to keep this... Um, fresh and real because these are some verses that we hear often they're verses that we we know they're verses that uh, come to us with a lot of weight and so as we heard them read this morning i i find it very interesting because the, the translation that you used in verse 55 says "O death where is thy sting O death where is thy victory the, the king james version says "O grave where is your victory and that is a, a poorer rendition of what we, than of what we heard this morning. Uh, Paul, as he is writing here, almost is, is mocking death. Not because of who he is, but because of who Jesus Christ is, and because of the fact that Jesus Christ just came forth from the dead, and he conquered death because he had no sin. He could do that. He conquers death, and he is almost mocking death. And I say that to start here this morning. He's saying death... You no longer have the sting that once you had. You no longer uh, have the victory that once you had. And so that's exciting to each of us. And that's why we've been spending so much time on the resurrection here in the last little while. One thing I'd like to say here, and uh, that is on occasion I send something out through Skype, a message out throughout the week. Does anybody ever find them? Does anybody ever get them? Okay, now and again, some of you find them. All right, I sent one out this morning um, about uh, the idea of Pentecost, and that was the day when the Spirit came. Today would be the day that the calendar marks Pentecost. And so it's interesting that today is the day that we're dealing with uh, the resurrection of Christ and specifically the Spirit of God. So here we are this morning, and uh, the songs that, that we sang this morning talk about Um, The first one, breathe on me, breath of God. The Spirit of God being breathed upon us. That happened on the day of Pentecost. Praise God for that day. And then again, the second one, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Why are we saying that? Today is Pentecost. Today is a day that we simply look at. We look back. Maybe we don't even do that. We forget about it. But it's something I want to bring up and just say, it was important. And beloved, it is important that we remember that. All right, we start out this morning. We entitle today's message, The Predominant Outcome of the Resurrection. The idea that the resurrection brings that that predominant uh, uh, view of who Christ was and the message that he gave to us. It proves the strength of who he was and the idea that Jesus has the outcome of life given to the mortal race of humanity. And so we experience this, we see this, and from day to day we experience that overcoming power that comes through knowing Christ as our Savior. That overcoming power that we see that Jesus Christ had and He gave to us as as the Son of God who came as the victor for you and I. Behold, I show you a great mystery. The idea here of a mystery Uh, The word could also be translated or could also mean, I'll show you a great secret. We will not always sleep as in death in the grave, but we will all be changed. This is a great mystery. It's a great secret. It's something that we don't fully understand, but by faith we can fully accept it. Amen? We can accept the fact that God is real and we can accept the fact that the paradox, number one, of of this whole idea of resurrection is we will not always be held, hemmed in, or bound by death. But as we talked last Sunday, God uses the whole avenue of death to open to you and I the whole reality of heaven and eternity, forever, eternally existing with God the Father. Death is the vehicle through which God uses to open to you and I the power of resurrection. The paradox we see of this morning, the paradox that we are talking about is that great secret. We read from 1 Thessalonians 4, the idea that by the word of the Lord, He will descend 
from heaven with a shout. He will come back. He will breathe upon us, not just the Spirit, but Jesus Himself will return. And so we started out with that verse this morning, and we're going to end up in the last section of the message, coming right back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the idea that those that are alive and living on this earth at the time of the return of Christ will be caught up to forever be with Him. It will not exclude those who are still alive. Praise God, right? We will all be changed, not just those whose bodies are are deceased and passed away, but all of us will be changed to be made like His glorious body, and we will forever be with the Lord. That's a paradox of the Christian life. That's a paradox of mortal existence. Forever we will live without the fear of death and without the bondage of sin. In 1 Corinthians 15, go back a couple verses, all right? If you go back one verse, we, we ran over this really quickly last week, and that is the idea of because we're human beings, we bear the image of the first Adam, which is a human image. But because of Jesus Christ, we bear the marks of a heavenly being because we are now sons of the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And as we're part of His family, we, we hold a part of that divine nature of Jesus Christ. We have that image of the heavenly Christ in us and through us and for us because of His victory that He wants to give to us. The last point that I want to give under, under the section of the paradox of the resurrection is He talks about the corruptible. This corruptible will put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. The corruptible, that which can die, will put on that which is mortal and everlasting and living forever. We went through a list last week. Uh, The list of, of glorious things that will happen how that our bodies are sown in corruption, but they reap that which is incorruptible. They're sown in dishonor, but they reap or they are raised in glory. It goes from weakness to power, from natural to spiritual. And then we see here the idea of from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal. So this continues that list there just briefly this morning. The predominant outcome of the resurrection, point number two, is that it gives us a prevailing ministry. This is a ministry that prevails. It's not just something that is limited to what I do or where I am, but it is limited to whatever God wants me to do, wherever God wants me to go, and wherever God wants you to go, whatever He wants you to do, you know, the Imbrocks are with us from, from Canada. All right? They're with us through Skype this morning. All right? And God's um, ministry reaches not only there, but around the world, around the globe, and wherever man exists, God's ministry continues to prevail. Just. Uh, I go back to this interesting book in the Old Testament, the book of Hosea. We read, we read about Hosea, and I think uh, one of the things that just stands out to me about this man is his faithfulness. God says, Hosea, you are a prophet of mine, and I'm going to call you to do the most, most despicable thing that a pos- possibly, maybe, that, that uh, the prophet should be doing. I want you to go, and I want you to join yourself. I want you to marry a prostitute of all things. Now, I don't think I'd be that faithful. I don't think I'd be that faithful. I, I look at Hosea and I see the faithfulness. You know why? Because he turns around and he goes back faithfully time after time after time. He, married, he, he names his child. The name that he gave his one child was, He is not my own. And yet he was faithful to his wife. He was faithful to what God called him. That's just amazing. Just amazing. But we go here in this book, and I I take your mind there this morning. 
because I see something very, very interesting here in Hosea. Hosea chapter 13. As uh, he is bringing this book to an end, uh, this, this book is, is pointing forward here in, in the 14th verse of chapter 13 of Hosea. It says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plague. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from my eyes. Though he be faithful among his brethren, the east wind will come, and the wind of the Lord shall come from the wilderness, and spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasures of all the, unple- of all the pleasant vessels. The idea that, that I'm bringing out here from Hosea, and that is Hosea through, through a vision or through an understanding of the future, looked forward to the time when death would be conquered. We see that being fulfilled here in 1 Corinthians 7, 15. We see that, that very thought that Hosea had so many, many years ago. He says uh, that the power of the grave would be stopped. That we would be redeemed from death. That's Hosea. Why? Because he had an understanding of the Father. He had an understanding way back then in the Old Testament. He had an understanding of what the resurrection was all about. Wow, now that's amazing. All right, here we are today on the day when we think of the Spirit of God coming and and, and infilling the church. And we have that that indwelling or that enlightening of of the Spirit in in our lives. But Hosea didn't have that, that fulfillment of the Spirit the same way. But he had a vision of the future. He had a vision of the resurrection. He had a vision of what it was to have that that outcome of the resurrection through Jesus Christ. Praise God for the way that He works through His people and through the way that He shows us who He is and through the way that He gives to us the, the ministry of His resurrection each day. The prevailing ministry of the resurrection of God doesn't just stop when the ministry of Jesus stopped. But it continues and it will continue to the end of time. Jesus asked that that great question. Will I find faith when I return? I say by the grace of God, He will find faith. Amen? Amen. He's going to find faith. We've, We've just gone through a time when it just seems like everything was hampered. But faith continues. And it continues as it is born within the bosom of God's followers and His people. The next point that I want to make under the idea of the prevailing ministry of the resurrection is the idea, three words here, and that is death, sin, and the law. And how the three of them are interconnected, each with the other. We see that here in, in uh, verses 53-56. to 56. Um, the incorruptible will be changed, the cor- corrupt will, be put, will put on incorruption, and then it says, Death, where is thy string? Grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And I'm going to try putting this together here, seeing if I, if I can make sense the, the way I put it together here. The sting of death is sin, because by sin, death gains authority over man. Death gains authority because of sin. And so sin has an authority over man because man is partaking of that which God says is not lawful. Therefore, by the law, sin gains strength. Because I'm involved in sin, now sin gains strength, and the law gives sin the character of rebellion and the consciousness of defiance. I know that's a big mouthful. But as, as I see the, this whole, these few verses here, there's so much impacted in these verses. The idea that death has a sting because we partake in sin. As we go back to the first part of the chapter, you'll remember maybe that I went over this whole idea that as a man partakes of sin, 
he is plagued by the strength of sin and therefore required by the law to taste of death. Christ tasted of death in spite of the fact that he was without sin and therefore the grave could not keep him. He tasted death and became the first fruits of them that slept, but he's also the first fruits that came back and showed himself in a glorified body to God and went back to the Father, ascended to the Father, and sent us the Spirit of God to lead us and to direct us and to help us to live our lives as John says. Jesus said, John records it, and it says, Jesus, Jesus says, I don't want to leave you comfortless. And that word comfortless means orphaned. I don't want you to be left as a helpless orphan on the doorstep of the enemy in this world. But I'm going to send my spirit to lead you and to direct you to be your comforter and to be your guide. Praise God for His provisions. Praise God for this prevailing ministry that He has for us and gives to us. Point number three, under the idea of the predominant outcome of the resurrection is that it gives a purifying action for each of us. The last few verses. Last two verses. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Number one, this starts out with the idea of thankfulness. But thanks be to God. This is a time of thanksgiving. We ought to be able to celebrate thanksgiving all the time. I have to confess I don't always. I'm not always thankful for everything. How about being thankful for uh, what we're just going through here in our, in our society? Can we be thankful? Yes, we can be with God's help. Doesn't mean we're always going to be. But God desires that we are able to be thankful in spite of what we go through. In spite of what we understand or don't understand, God is calling us to a life of thanksgiving. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. Paul is talking to the redeemed here. He's talking to those who know the power of the resurrection. Those who know that, that the outcome of the resurrection gives us the power to live victoriously over sin. God gives grace to those that are living that redeemed life and He gives us victory through Jesus Christ and through His divine work goes right back to the divine nature. Beloved, if we don't give our hearts and our lives to Him and experience that new living divine nature, we aren't going to know the divine work of Jesus Christ living in our lives. So it comes back to that indwelling of His Spirit. We see that that victory comes through our Lord Jesus Christ and that's why He was able to say, Father, not My will, but Thine be done. He was able to say, in, in my flesh, I don't desire to go up Calvary's brow. I don't desire to be crucified. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The divine work of Jesus Christ isn't something that Jesus just came and talked about, but He lived it out through a life of servanthood. He lived it out by saying, Father, I am willing to submit to You even though it cost me everything I have. Thankfully, God comes and He redeems us through His grace and He brings us to the place where He gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that divine work becomes that which we can not only see, but we can experience. It's not just something that we read about in history book. It's not just something that we read about in the Bible, but it's something that becomes real to us because of the change that comes through Jesus' work on the cross. Going back to our key verse this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. It says, Then we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Therefore comfort ye one another with these words. 
The idea that we will be. We will meet the Lord. We will be with Him. We will see Him. We will come to that place where we realize that the outcome of the resurrection takes me from the person that once I was and makes me into the person that He wants me to be. Praise God for that work in our lives. The last part of this verse is where I'd like to like to end up this morning. The challenge I'd like to leave with you this morning is the idea that we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Just like to think about the labor that we have. Jesus came and He said He did always those things that pleased His heavenly Father. His labor of love was not that which pleased Himself. But His labor was a labor that was glorifying to His heavenly Father. Beloved, when our labor is so egocentrically evolved around me, it becomes a labor that is vain, empty, and hollow. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Be unmovable. Work less to please me and more to please my Heavenly Father. Let us be less spectators and more workers for the kingdom of God. If we know that the predominant outcome of the resurrection brings you and I to a place where we cannot sit idly by allowing things to go the way they go, but rather we do as Jesus Christ did and we come to the place where we say, Father, I'm willing to be obedient until the end. I'm willing to be obedient unto death if that's what you call me to. Why? Because He says, if we know the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, the same one that brought Jesus Christ from the dead, the same power that brought Christ from the dead is the same power that can dwell and is dwelling, I'm convinced, in the heart and lives of His people. Beloved, that's exciting because that includes each of us. May that resurrection power be the same power that we walk in today. May we as His people know that the outcome of the resurrection showed the predominant reality of Jesus Christ to you and I. And it proves to us that Christ is not only faithful, but He will be faithful. He is faithful. And He will continue to be faithful throughout time. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning just thanking you for who you are. We thank you that we can meet in this way today. Lord, give us strength to be the persons that you want us to be. Forgive us when we fail. Guide us with your spirit. May we forever be, be filled with you. May your divine presence and nature be that which becomes part of who we are. And may we be changed into your glorious image. In Jesus' name we pray.